Great. Thank you. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you, Jeff. It is so sweet and humbling to hear you say those nice things. Um, I, we, our paths crossed with Jeff and me and I met you, like you said, a year and a half ago. And I had no idea I'd be introduced to the world of the Canadians. And you guys are awesome and fun. And I make Jeff and me and keep saying composite to me because I love it. We say resins and <laughs> just make them say all the Canadian words. And um, one of the best parts of being a speaker, being a dentist, and getting to connect with everybody, highlight of it for me is meeting new friends. And uh, a year and a half ago, our paths crossed, and I'm so thankful for these opportunities because we've gotten to uh, share stories and how dentistry is going in the U.S. versus Canada and um, life stories. And thank you so much, Sean, for the invitation. And Dr. Mustafa, your talk was excellent. Um, such great points. And I really am very fortunate to be part of this group because for those of you that are watching, I know the majority of you are new graduates or you've been out for a few years and you've kind of just been thrown into this pandemic and, and, and dentistry has changed and uh, it, it's, it's very confusing. So I'm very lucky and fortunate to be part of this initiative that you've taken with this fast track and these 30 days of these talks and it's been Incredible. You're very lucky. I wish I had this fast track when I was a new grad because we were figuring it out. We were trying to figure it out ourselves and we didn't quite have the mentors as easily as you guys are available to now. So um, we're going to get started. You've been through 30 days or three weeks of most amazing talks, technical, uh, clinical, seeing cases, building brands, things like that. So my angle is going to hopefully be a little bit different. Um, this is meant to be fun, and this is meant to just get you to think outside of the box. Now, our world kind of came to an end professionally 10 weeks ago. We've been thrown into practices shutting down financially, how to you know pick back up, taking care of our team members, questions that we just don't have the answers to, of uh, what our patients expect. And so well, I've had a lot of uh, realizations in the past 10 weeks, but one of them that really stood up there was now more than ever, as we're rebuilding everybody, our brands, building our brand is so important, creating that team value, and we're rebuilding, we're reopening, we're relaunching uh, back into the community and, and telling our patients that, that we are a safe, healthy place to come to. That has become so important and almost as important for you newer graduates as knowing how to find the depth of a canal or knowing when you've perforated a tooth or understanding your you know implant sizes knowing how to build your brand and what you stand behind to me i value that a lot and it's important so that's what our next you know about 40 minutes or so is our topic will be on um so basically you've got your degree now you've got your degree now what uh there's a thousand things that you can be focusing on but you know we ask yourselves why did you become a dentist and so if you, if this slide was, you know, from 10 weeks ago, I became a dentist for Instagram. I literally, I was like, I wanted to put the good pictures out there. I wanted to put these cheeky little, you know, sayings, inspirational quotes, you know, I never dreamed of it. I worked for it. And you get to, you get so cocky because you've got this degree and you think you're a baller and you think you're a badass. And we are, I mean, we're superheroes and you, we put it out there and we did some great dentistry for years. Um, and then 10 weeks ago, it kind of all changed. And so now, we're rebuilding, rebranding, and while yes, you do it for the gram, and you do it to show your friends your great cases, and you take, do it to take care of your patients, but you have to start from the beginning, and I want to take you to that to the beginning, and this is kind of probably where most of your mind is at right now. You are students or new grads or a couple of years out, and you, you're coming from these environments where there's 40 or 50 of you in one room, and you, it takes you three hours to prep a crown and you're doing it in five appointments and things like that. So it's hard to wrap your brain around some of these lectures and, and, and the CE that we put out there about cranking out a CEREC in 20 minutes and things like that. So while all of that can be intimidating, start focusing on what your brand is going to be. That's where you start. That's your starting line. And I get it though, you know, this is the US and this is a few years ago, but uh, dental education is very expensive. Um, you guys are coming out with more debt than any of us ever did 10, 15 years ago. And it, it's not as easy to build that unicorn office that is uh, fully digitally integrated and, uh, you know, to take out extra, all those extra loans on top, stacked on top of your dental education. So like, you know, Dr. Mustafa was saying earlier, 
you know, you go out there, you work and you hustle and you're an associate or you're in a group practice for a while until you're able to build your brand, until you're able to build your unicorn office, as I call them. Uh, and it, we get it. It's, it's, I don't know how patients, or, I'm sorry, doctors now are able to do what we were able to do 10 years ago. But my point is, though, you don't have to have, get a loan for millions of dollars, guys. Your brand can even be free. Your brand is who you are as a dentist. And regardless of what environment that you're in, you can project that brand. Because most of you are part of this amazing millennial digital like, age group. Now, I like to think I'm a millennial, but I'm not. Um, I you know, think I'm forever in my 20s, but I have my mentees, my dental mentees who are out here. They're amazing. I'm giving them a shout out. They're literally texting me five minutes ago, and they're like, don't forget to talk about your Instagram, and, and they're keeping me young. <laughs> they're reminding me that I'm definitely not a millennial, but you guys, most of you are, and that's such an advantage for you. You have, you know, you know, social media, you know, digital, you know what building your brand is like um, uh, in the, in the Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn world. Uh, we were watching, I love, we watched the series, The Last Dance by Michael Jordan, about Michael Jordan, because we're Chicagoans. And it was amazing because he is the greatest of all time. And to see how he built his brand and his empire and what he stood for was just amazing athleticism and, and, and brought the sense of business into sportsmanship. And he did that in the 80s. He did that before these social media platforms existed. And that was tough. And that's why he is the greatest of all time. And a lot of us that are older on this talk today, we've had to build those brands without this social media platform. But for all of you that are out there now, this is all, it's on a platter for you. You're teaching us things that we need to be doing. So utilize that. Um, those are your strengths. And when I, and I'll get into what more a little bit, what building your brand means, but just keep that in the back of your mind that you have access to all these apps on your phone that with the click of a button, you're putting that content out there of what you value, why patients should come to you, why your dentistry is set apart from the other person down the street, and why they can feel confident in the care that you're going to provide. So start thinking about that a little bit as we're going through this. Now, we're going to attempt to play a video here. Sham, tell me if this is not going to, it's not going okay, but this is a two-minute video and we'll discuss how this relates to dentistry when you're done, when we're done. There's no sound, Mona, but we should be okay. Okay. All right. Well, if there's no sound, then I'm going to narrate this for you. Okay. All right. So can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, good. So basically, he's. this is a 1950s pit stop. This is NASCAR. This is uh, everybody, the whole team coming together, and they're coming in for a shared goal. And I love this video because this is what a 1951 Formula um, One pit stop was. And, and, the, and it's just the narrator in the background saying, you know, he's taking off the tires, and he's r r getting the windshields cleaned up, and there's one driver, and that driver is the dentist, okay? And this is your team that you're surrounded by. And this is dentistry in the 80s. This is dentistry in the 80s. You should get to a common goal. Um, everyone's kind of doing their job. At the end, they're going to talk about the length of time this took. And the audience was so excited because now they're setting him off to do his job. And it was 67 seconds. 67 seconds for that pit stop. And they're off. And everyone, the crowd is cheering. And but now it's changed, guys. This is dentistry today. This is the standards that all of us are held to by our patients and our community. This is what they want to see. And so this is a Formula One you know, pit stop today. And it is all about the image, our brand, the uniformity, the, the matching uniforms. Everyone is there specialized to do their one role because you know what? We're not, we don't have 67 seconds anymore. That's your pit stop. You got five seconds, get, get it done and get it out. And everyone did their job. And I just love relaying this video and comparing it to dentistry because that is what we're expected to. We're expected to do it fast. We're expected to do it great. We're expected to make it look pretty. We're expected to make it successful. And we're expected to put it all out there on social media then and make it look pretty. So 
that's why we need to create your brand, guys. And just to get a little bit about my background here is that, you know, I've been practicing about 11 years. I started out with a large group practice for six years while I was having my young babies and, and uh, wanted to just figure out what type of practice I wanted to have eventually one day. But that, that experience was very invaluable. It was, um, it allowed me to sharpen my clinical skill set and you didn't have to start thinking about the management of owning a business right away. So for those of you that are torn about as new grads, I would highly suggest working as an associate somewhere first and sharpen those skills. Uh, but then about five years ago, I was able to purchase my own private practice and started that journey of truly building my brand. Now, for those of you that are newer grads or newer associates, uh, these, there's lots of options for what you can do after graduation. You can continue, you know, specialize or do a, a AEGD or GPRs. You can join large groups. You can transition from the small group, or you can start a, build a startup. I, I think now it might be it might be a little difficult to jump right into a startup now, but you know, with who knows with this post COVID era, talk to your bankers. Like Dr. Mustafa is saying, make those networks with your bankers and your accountants and your attorneys, and see if the timing is right for you. Everybody's got a different. Uh, background. Everyone's starting out at a different place, but you pick which track of these will will be the best for you. My advice, though, is if you, wait to jump into your own practice if you can, maybe for a little bit because you you want to sharpen your clinical skill set a little bit before you're jumping into the brand aspect of it or or running the business. I didn't know what a PNL was before I bought a business. I honestly I say this all the time. I honestly thought it was like a porn term, like a pornographic term, probably. <laughs> I was like, what's a PNL? Now I know that is your profit and loss sheet that you report to your accountant every month or they report to you and you go over it with them because you don't learn this in dental school, guys. None of you are learning how to financially run a business. So if you can find a mentor or learn from somebody, and from what I've learned in the past 30 days, you're surrounded by some phenomenal mentors here who are so willing to share their knowledge and their experiences and set you guys up for the success, you know, pick their brains about this. But the first year, just focus on your clinical dentistry. Try to sharpen those skills first and foremost. So what you can start doing now and what I started doing from the moment that I decided to buy my practice is set up your goals. You know, what I didn't know what branding and dentistry meant. I didn't know what being a KOL for Dental Supply Serona or, you know, having your office photographed and all of that would really entail. I just knew that I wanted to create an office or create a practice that reflected the personality and reflected the, the, my vision and my mottos and my mission statements that I wanted to be so proud of and put out there. Now, what does that mean? A lot of you that are new grads are like, I don't know even where to start. You're not designers, you're not interior designers, you're not you know, tech designers, um, and you're just learning that dentistry. But what you can start doing is simplify it. Just start writing. This is from a piece of paper that I wrote down years ago, probably with a drink in my hand at a bar somewhere, and saying, what do I wanna put out there? If you had a blank canvas, what's your brand? So I made my list, and it was, Hands down, I wanted to have high quality clinical care. No one wants to do crappy dentistry. So you wanted to put the best quality clinical care that I could put out there because most dentists, we have very big egos and we think our work is the best and we put it out there and we want everyone to recognize that because you trained hard for it. So high quality clinical care. And I wanted patients to have a positive experience. I was so tired of, well, I hate my dentist. And you know, we're like, well, guess what? We hate you too sometimes, <laughs> but you can't say that because you need them to pay their bill. But I was tired of being the villain in all the Disney movies and you, know, you see Finding Nemo and the dentist is always the villain or you hate going to them. And it's like, why do, we, why do we allow that culture? Why don't we change it where our patients have these positive experiences and know that we are there to help take them out of pain? So I wanted to create that as my brand. I definitely wanted efficiency in my patient and team workflow. I, I'm, I hate like that fodder downtime. I hate the time where I'm just waiting to get started. And if your limiting factor of getting started on something is yourself or something that's controllable, it just gets under your skin. You know, you are a limiting factor should be patients aren't coming in or they're reluctant to start the treatment. It shouldn't be that we're not efficient and ready for it. So I wanted to create an environment where you're ready to go for any treatment at any time. And that is that digital integration and same day dentistry. I didn't know what that truly meant at the time. We do now because we've been practicing it for five years, but 
I just knew that I wanted to be able to have patients come in and I, I was tired in my corporate office of having them come in, you triage their emergency, then you have to schedule them a week out and you know, you're turning over rooms. And I said, why can't we just do it all at one appointment? They're willing to stay, we, we can do it. Let's get them taken care of in one visit. Now more than ever, that's gonna be huge guys because of our you know, post COVID environment that we're practicing in. PPE is not cheap. And the less times you have to turn over a room, the less times we have to turn over a PPE, the better. So yeah, really, it really, it really hits home when I started thinking about what same day dentistry was. I mean, and it, in same day dentistry, not only is valuable for your patient, but it's also, it's a great way to have increased revenue. Part of my brand was I wanted to be able to bring home a substantial, you know, income for my family and for me and my shoe and my shoe habit and my handbag habit. And I wanted to be able to increase my revenue. So that's part of building that brand as well. But uh, probably one of the most important was to find that work-life balance. I've been working, working, working. We have young kids and there's that, you know, that cheesy saying, trying to find the ways of working smarter and not harder. But that there's so much merit to that. And for those of you, you youngins out there, it'll hit you one day that you're tired of being the hamster on the wheel and you want to find ways to work smarter and bring in more revenue and get more satisfaction out of it and be able to do what your life, you know, what you want to do in life and what those goals are more. So I set out for that. But I didn't exactly always know what smart branding was. So start thinking about for you, what does smart branding mean to you guys? I didn't have an MBA in dental brands. I just started looking around me in my life. What are things that appeal to me and why do they appeal to me? We love our watches. I love my watches. And this is a Panerai. This is a Panerai. And I just, I love that it's, it's a, a history. It's a, a, a family in Italy and it's, it's, it's this legacy company and they put, you know, 350 components into one watch and they can make it tick. And that just to me is so cool how these artists and watchmakers, the craftsmanship that comes out of their work is, you know, hundreds of years later, still there. And so that was a, that was a really, just a beautiful smart brand. Most of you recognize what this is. This is a Peloton, which it's crazy because two years ago, maybe people didn't know what a Peloton was. It's a bike. This is a stationary bike. This is the bike that was in our parents' bedroom growing up and hanging the laundry on there. And everyone had that. We, your parents probably still have one. But now Peloton, this came out, this brand, and they made it app based. They made it a, a way for you to connect with other Peloton users. They made it a way for you to be digitized and track your goals. And all of a sudden they're booming. And so that was an appealing brand to me. It has nothing to do with dentistry, but it was something that I was very attracted to. So I said, what is it that Peloton did to create this smart brand? It can be as simple as little things, little innovations that cost $2 to create a, a better workflow to create things easy in your life. These little tea, you know, to hold your tea bags, just cute little brand items. We live in Milwaukee, so this is the land of Harley Davidson. Um, and Harley Davidson is this huge brand that crosses all socioeconomic um, statuses, your age groups, um, all diversities. And it's, they've built that brand. Yamaha is a bike, Harley's a culture. If you're riding on Yamaha, you got a bike. But if you're a Harley rider, you're part of this culture that you connect with other people that are Harley riders. And they've done a great job of creating that smart branding too. It doesn't target just one demographic. Anybody can be a Harley rider. And so I love that about Harley here. And you know, we all we love our Starbucks. You can go around the world. And if you see this little green logo, the Starbucks logo, there's brand recognition. I, I know that if I see the logo and I'm traveling, you're gonna walk in and you're gonna get a good cup of coffee and you're gonna get good service. So I was like, I want my brand to be like that. I wanna be able to look at my logo and patients know that. So Starbucks has done a great job because they're very uniform in their, uh, the way they train across all their, all their um, franchises and, and all their stores. You're gonna get a good cup of coffee, good service. So that's pretty good. That's a pretty good brand to me. And, you know, and Tesla is their, the, the, the gadgets and the bells and the whistles and electric car, the car of the future. That is a, a beautiful brand. They have digitized and made it electric and it's sustainable. So these were all brands that had nothing to do with dentistry, but things that were appealing to me. And so I started writing those down and I want you guys to start doing that. Now, whether you're a new graduate or you're three or four years out or you're 20 years out, you can still be reinventing your brand and it's free. This, all these thought processes are free. 
So the ultimate brand to me was the Apple Store. This is on the heels of us building our office. And I wanted that Apple Store experience. We've all experienced it. It's clean, it's sleek, it's tech, it's fun. You have that experience of opening your Apple boxes and, and, and putting your you know, pieces together. And you know, I have a stack of all my old iPad and iPod and phone boxes in my closet. You just don't wanna get rid of them. Why? They're boxes, but they created that experience. And that's what I wanted to translate into inpatient care with my brand. So I we went and I told my architects, I want to create the Apple store. But you have to back up your brand with your why. And again, this is the, you know, cliche, um, you know, picture here that everyone talks about why are we all working smarter, not harder. But all of you can relate to one portion of this. Now, the newer grads, you're probably working right now or you're going to be looking for jobs because you need the money. You need the money to start your life, to pay off your debt. Some of you that are older um, may be working your, your why or why you're working to smart, work smarter is because you want some more time with your family or the things that you love. Some of you want more fulfillment. I know Jeff and Mian are working because they want to live on the Beaver Lake with their fancy boats. So that's their why. So <laughs> why are we working? Why should we be working smarter, not harder? I was getting tired of being the hamster on the wheel. And this is my why. I wanted to spend more time with my family, but still be proud of my clinical work. So. I'll go through this quickly because I want to spend more time on other things. But basically, we took, I found this opportunity of this building and I turned it into this. And this building is a reflection of my brand. I built my office on the second floor. We were able to get Kohler as our tenants downstairs. Uh, Kohler is a local Wisconsin company. And I was fortunate enough by lining up, like Dr. Mustafa said, lining up your team of people to help you make your vision come true. And so about four years ago, we were able to build and we um, moved into the new Bayshore Dental. Every color, every piece of art, every workflow, every glass, every outlet of electrical outlet was thought about and designed by us. Not because I'm a designer and I don't want any of you to be intimidated that none of you can do this, but it's because I just thought about, well, what makes sense? What's smart branding? What's going to help our workflows? So even if you're years and years away from ever building your unicorn practice, just start writing them on your notes of uh, things that appeal to you or what would be important to you. I told my architects, I want the Apple Store of Dentistry, and this is what we came up with. And it's, you know, single entry operatories. Um, it's been referenced how that's important now more than ever, but patients wanted privacy. Our patients don't want to see what's going on next door. So we created a single entry. Glass doors, very open, very clean, very sleek. And the stars of my show, the stars of my office is my digital technology. So you put it out there, guys. Put your technology out there. Don't hide your Cerex and your pans and the back rooms and things like that. Let your patients see it. Let them know that you've invested your resources and your education, your time to learn about this equipment to help it co-diagnose with you to give them the best care possible. And that's the type of verbiage that I want you guys to start using because too often, we just hide behind and read, read a scan in the back and then come and tell the patients. Let them see that. So we built this beautiful office. We have screens up everywhere to show patients their, their, their um, scans. And you know we have a very welcoming front. But it, this waiting room essentially reflects my brand. And, and it's not something that has to cost a lot. I mean, our flooring is from like local hardware stores. It's, it's that linoleum vinyl tile that's kind of just brand off brand hardware store flooring. So it doesn't have to cost so much to build your brand. Save those pennies for your equipment, invest in your equipment. You can just throw a slap of paint on your walls and rebrand re yourself with that. But I realized then and I had this new overhead and I'm gonna have these new costs. So how am I gonna turn this survival mode of just working, working, working into thrival mode where I'm thriving in this new office. And I realized I came up with this one, it's a simple statement. I needed to maximize my digital workflows to increase that daily production without compromising that patient care. So how do we do that? Technology, technology. You know, I don't have to tell you guys, you guys have seen this a thousand times. Uh, CEREC was my gateway. <laughs> It was my gateway drug of digital technology. It's like the, you know, the uh, Boone's Farm that you drink in your parents' basement when you're in high school. I don't know if that's just a Kentucky thing that we did, but I'm used to having an audience that laughs at all my cheesy jokes. So I can't tell if I'm actually funny or not, but, um, but we, we invested in, tech, in the CERC technology right away. And that was hands down the best tangible and intangible return on investment that you're going to get. Tangible meaning it's going to cost you this many dollars, you're going to crank out this many crowns, you're going to pay it off, and here's your investment. But the intangible ROI is that patient experience. They are wowed by 
be the same day dentistry. You've heard all of this before, but start using the verbiage of you have this fractured tooth. You know, your number four is cracked right there. But if you stay today in about an hour, we'll get a brand new crown on there and you don't have to come back. And it's just one visit. I'm only going to meet up one time. Stuff like that appeals to our patients. They are busy. They don't want to keep coming back to get numb. So start using that verbiage to help sell your treatment plans um, for doing that same day dentistry. But hands down, Sarek was the best ROI that I've had. But also your cone beam. These are beautiful images. We standard of care now for us just to be able to see things in 3D. And we always joke around, you know, don't have that 2D vision because you don't know what's going to be coming up pe peeking around the corner from 3D. But utilize that cone beam and and get your patients to help like look at this with you. Don't do this in the back. Do it in the operatories. I'll show them the PA and I'll say, let's map out our nerve. Let's map out this nerve so you can see my game plan to do your root canal today. And that's what resonates with them. And they see us drawing the nerve and mapping it out on the cone beam. And they're just blown away. Because guess what, guys? They see you, you using all this technology to create a better outcome. And they're going to have more confidence in your care. Now, they don't know that I may perf out the, the, the mesial out there because it looks angled and who knows. But they're going to feel very confident. And that, and that positivity that they're sending back to you, that confidence lifts us up. That's what gives us our mojo to go in there and do the best damn root canal we can for that patient. So let them see you mapping out that nerve. Don't hide behind that technology. Our pan and our cone beam is out in the open. We put lights behind it and patients walk right past it. And they say, what is that? And I was like, well, that's our, that's our cone beam scanner. If we need to, we'll take a scan of you. It takes 14 seconds and with minimal radiation now. And I can see 3D all aspects of your, of your jaw. And they're just so wowed by that. So put your pan in the open. Start talking to your patients about that. Give new patient tours even if you want. I know some offices do that. And that's just going to solidify their investment in you. So instead of just saying, well, you know, this is a number 30. You may have something at the apex. Start showing them these scans. We pull ours up. My assistant will pull ours up in, on the screen right there. And it'll be sitting up there before I even walk in the room. And I walk in our room and the patients are saying, well, what is that? What is that? Well, that's your infection. What is that? Let them see that I'm diagnosing with them right there. I'm not doing it in the back and then coming in on my high horse and saying, I see a pulpitis. You're doing it together because now they own that experience with you. They're seeing your thought process. And that, and this, you know, this methodology may not work for everybody, but it's worked with me. I'm trying to do, I'm trying to have our patients see less of the scary white coat syndrome and let them know that, hey, we're human. I have a degree, I have experience, but I may miss something too. So let's kind of figure this out together. And, and patients connect to that. They just feel so much more at ease when we're showing them their scans right there. So start doing that. Make, your, make the scans and your pictures and showing your technology part of your brand and your patients will absolutely increase their confidence in you. And confidence in you. I take my patients, we'll show them, hey, I'm gonna go pick out your, your crown color, let me show you. And they come up and we'll, we'll take a look at it together. And they're just blown away by the Sarek. And every time, and we've done this thousands of times, every time I see their faces looking at it, I'm looking at the patient and it just makes you feel good that you're proud to be a dentist. You're not just hamster on the wheel churning out resins. You're actually changing their lives and you're changing their smiles. And, and we're proud of this technology. So share that experience with them. And that was your, that's my brand. And this is all free. You can do this in an old office. You can do it in a new office. You don't have to invest thousands into this. Just get in the, in the modality of involving your patients in that story with you. So basically that's, you know, kind of my story. But I, it's, it's very funny for me to be at this point where I see, you know, become old enough where I can say, well, if I knew then what I know now, or when I become, I think I'm young, but I become old enough where I can say I have some pearls for you guys. And, you know, I was given this platform to be able to talk to all of you new, young, fresh minds. And so I want to take this next maybe 15, 20 minutes and this opportunity just to sh share a few pearls with you. And they're kind of all over the place, but just bear with me because it's, I wish I knew some of this 15 years ago that we know now. Ergonomics matters, guys, okay? Ergonomics matters. I know it's the old people say to young people, but it's true. The way that you treat your body today is how your body's gonna treat you in 10 years. And especially for you, my, my fellow females out there, if you're carrying pregnancies while you're working and stuff, it's gonna take a toll on you. Pay, take time for self-care. Do your stretches in the hallway. You know, Focus on building those good practice habits now of how you're practicing 
because then it's going to become habit for your body and your body will naturally go into those positions. Okay. So start for focusing on that ergonomics now it's because really, I mean, musculoskeletal disorders are a huge reason why people are retiring early. Now we are not all Jeff and Mian who get these massive buyouts and can live on the Beaver Lake. Some of us actually have to hustle and work a little bit harder. So we have to have these long sustainable careers where we are working for 20 or 30, 40 years and dentistry ranks up there with one of the hardest professions on your back. So that's all I'm going to say about that. It's my high horse, but focus on your ergonomics. And I'm happy to talk to any of you guys another time or an email, some ways that you can practice good ergonomic dentistry. This is one of my passions. Another thing I've learned, transparency equals accountability. And I've been saying this for years, but now more than ever, you guys are all getting launched into this post-COVID environment where patients are going to question every single protocol that you have and question of, is this, is this water line clean? Is this mask clean? Is this, is this instrument, have they been sanitized? So put it out, but our, our sterilization is wide open. Patients walk right past it. And I always tell them, you know, if you can see it, then we're being held accountable to it. There's nothing dirty that's tucked in the corners. So let them see your systems because our systems are costly. Our systems have taken a lot of effort for teams of dental vendors and everybody to come in. You train your teams to use these systems and the way we color coordinate our cassettes and everything is labeled. And to the, to the T, everything has a efficient workflow system in our practice. Let your patients see that. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. It needs to be something that you showcase to your patients and they actually really will value that. Uh, yesterday was our first full day back with full hygiene and the full stack schedule. I've been open for emergencies only, but we've trained and practiced those systems the past, last week, um, our updates, our new protocols, and it works because it went smoothly yesterday and patients were very impressed with how our workflows have been. So let them see all of that. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of taking internal pictures take these pictures. Your internal camera is meant to be a co-diagnosing tool for you. So train your hygiene. Um, my hygienists know every, every time I walk into a room, they need to have one picture up on the screen. I don't care if it's a potential cracked tooth, it could be a, a, something that needs treatment, an open margin, uh, excessive calc built up, something. There's something in every mouth that needs to be addressed. So use those pictures because I'm getting tired of being a used car salesman where I'm just having to sell this treatment. Let them see it. Look at that crack, Mrs. Jones. I would get it replaced with a crown right now. Would you like to stay today? Let's get it done today. Otherwise, we could get you in soon. You know, start using that verbiage and then boom, you're stacking your schedule with same day dentistry. We can't do this alone. Absolutely cannot do this alone. You cannot be in 20 places at once. So surround yourself with those who share your vision, vision guys. When you're building your team, if there's people that are just not drinking your Kool-Aid, then unfortunately they need to tell them that this is not the place for them because you, everybody needs to believe your vision and get it. I love my cheesy sayings. And one of them is that if you replace I with we, then illness becomes wellness. And it's so true. We can only be wellness providers if everyone on your team feels that way. And it's not just a clock in clock out job for them. So how do you cultivate that? You just keep spewing out your brand and your vision. And uh, you know, our staff meetings, I'm always telling them what, what's important to us and creating team value. And you listen, listen to them. Find out what's important to your team. What do they value? Most of your team will be incentivized by money. So then you create into programs, bonuses based on production goals, things like that. But you'll be surprised. A lot of them will value that um, they'll be incentivized by feeling like you value them, that we're not just the doctor and they're the support staff to make our day go better. It's a team approach. And once I started thinking like that in the past three or four years, we get a lot of comments from patients that feel like, I feel like I'm walking to a big family and you guys are all on the same page. And I don't have to repeat myself 10 times because you've all communicated together about what's next. So those little, little things add up and then and it creates a more harmonious work environment. So make sure you surround, your, surround yourselves with those who are sharing your vision. Now more than ever, have a mentor and be a mentor. My mentees that are out there could probably tell you, I tell them this all the time. I've learned as much from you in their graduating dental school as you probably, you can say you've learned from me. Always be learning from somebody, whether it's someone older than you, um, and be a mentor to somebody. You can always be a mentor. Even if you think, you're, well, I'm two months out with my degree, I don't have much to teach. You can teach somebody something. You can teach us old people how to enhance our digital platform a little bit on social media. Always be a mentor. And I want you guys to always be lifelong students. Don't ever stop learning. I 
always wanted to place implants. I never did for the first 10 years, but 10 years into my career, I sought out on that journey. And so I'm gonna spend the next five minutes just kind of walking you through that journey. But when I say be a LifeLock student, it doesn't matter what it is. So for you, it may not be implants, but start thinking as I'm going through this, it might be ortho, it might be sleep apnea, it might be TMJ, it may be getting an MBA. Whatever it is, pick a project and, and just invest completely into it and be a lifelong student. And for me, it was wanting to do implants for several reasons. I couldn't even fathom even five years ago that this scan would be something that I've done. And now we're doing them and it has been a huge revenue generator for our practice, but also a huge source of fulfillment for me. Because I was starting to think about it. Why, what am I sending out the door? Complicated oral surgery, out, I'm not dealing with it. Complicated endo, hell no. Oh, sorry, can I say hell, sorry. Heck no, I'm not dealing with it. I'm sending them out. I do, I'll do uh, my basic oral surgery. I'll do my basic endo. Complex prosthetics, I'll team up with people. But if, if I'm not getting fulfillment and I'm not confident I can do it, well, I'm gonna team up with somebody else and they're gonna help me. But I was sending all my implants out. And we're in North Shore, Milwaukee. There's a lot of single teeth missing and we call them North Shore Nancy's here. And they, you know, they want their, their implant done right away. And so I'm scrambling to work with the specialist. I was like, why? Why was I not doing my own implants? I was intimidated. There's a liability to it. I'm drilling in the bone now all of a sudden. I have to be a surgeon. There's a cost to it. There's a training to it. And I talk to my mentors and they're just like, want to smack me over the head. They're like, you've built the office. You have the ability to do the CE, just do it. And so my project a couple of years ago was to start learning implants. But I'm a very numbers driven person and you have to be if you're going to build your brand and be successful in it. And, but I started realizing, you know, um, I know, uh, Jeff and me and like to use their, you know, their booms, like what do you, can you do in an hour and your ROIs? And this is my basic version of it was in one hour, you camera out six resins and you know, it's, you're billing out 1320. You can hammer out one crown and you're billing out 1400, which is doing a single, you know, unit uh, crown in one hour is, is a very good ROI for your time and efforts put in. Just the placement, just the guided placement of one implant I was sending out $2,800 every time I'd sent them to get their implant and they'll come back and I would restore it. And I was like, why am I doing that? So that really was my driving factor. But before you launch anything, you need to know, know your numbers. And again, this is for implants, but do it for any other modality of dentistry that you're gonna do. I, I made it on a pen and paper, just, okay, what's my training cost gonna be? What's my inventory cost? What, my investment was about 35,000. And when I say training courses, I'm taking my assistant with me to these courses, things like that. And I said, I'm gonna be writing a check for $35,000 to learn how to do implants. So the way my mind works is keep, keep it simple. I said, all right, one implant's 2,800. Let's say about $800 overhead, rough, rough numbers. Each implant will create about a profitability of $2,000 that I'm sending out. So I always come down to what's your ROI. So I said, I had to do 17.5 implants to recuperate that $35,000 investment. That's how my mind works. I kept it simple. I don't have a fancy MBA to understand all those P&Ls. I just know implant number 18 that I place at Bayshore Dental will mean that I'm creating a profit on that. And that was my goal. That was my growth goal. And, you know, we hit that in like two months. And so everything since then has been worth it in solidifying why I did that investment. So it's been a great uh, plan for me to do implants and I love doing that. But take it, if you wanna do it for ortho, if you wanna do it for TMJ, whatever, sleep apnea, find out what your costs are gonna be, what's your profit on each one, and then wrap your brain around that ROI. Because we have to start thinking, like we're business owners too, we're not just dentists, we can't just focus on the clinical. Even if you're an associate, you need to build your own brand and be a business owner of your own schedule. So that was my journey with implants. Um, we set up all your workflows. You can't just invest all of this and not come back and bring it back home and, and, and hit the ground running with it. So have those growth goals, have those plans. Um, we worked with our lab partners. We did marketing plans and guess what? Social media is free. You can put all that free content out there and your first five cases, I said, first five cases, we'll do them a discounted so they can be learning cases, things like that. And once you, once you wrote down on paper these growth goals, it's a lot easier for to meet those goals and, and hold your team accountable to it. Every month I was like, guys, remember, you know, we want to launch this implant program. How are we doing? Keep circling back to it and you will be successful in your skill set, but also financially in these programs. And I'm just going to quickly run through, you know, how we did ours. Stay organized. OCD organization creates discipline. Okay. That's what I think OCD is. If you're organized, you're going to be disciplined. 
Every component costs money. You don't want to lose anything. You never want to be out of something. Create that discipline with your, with your team members. But the way that you're talking to your patients, so let's say it's ortho, sleep, TMJ device, um, implant. We created a concierge patient experience. They don't need to know. At least they didn't want to know, and it was intimidating. Oh, I'm going to use a titanium abutment at 3.5, and that component bills out for this. Your insurance is covering this, blah, blah, blah. It was overwhelming, and their patients were just walking out the door, and they said, implants are very overwhelming. I'm just not ready for this. I simplified it because that's what patients want. Think about when you go into your doctor's office, and they're telling you, I'm going to screw in a titanium screw somewhere in your body, and let me give you 20-minute verbiage on it. It's going to overwhelm you. But if they simplified it, then you're going to accept that treatment plan. So we just say we have a global fee. I say $5,000 per implant site. Now, some people, the haters are going to be like, well, some make less, some make more. To me, it's law of averages. If I have to put an extra bone graft in there, I'll cover that cost. Um, you know, or if you end up placing two instead of one, I tell my patients, you know, we'll work together on that. But in general, $5,000 per site, that's your global fee. But with that, we're going to, you're going to show them all of our protocols. We're going to show them we have this comfort menu. You know, I know it can be a scary time for you to come in here. We, we let's talk about nitrous oxide, some sedation options, things like that. We give them all their pre-op meds, all lined up, labeled, and it's very official. And then their post-op instructions and everything. And so then they feel like we've invested a lot into the details of making sure this is successful. That's the reassurance that they need for their investment. If you go to a Toyota dealership and you're buying a Camry or you're going to a Tesla and you're buying a dealership and you're buying a Tesla, that's a very different customer experience because of the price point that you're paying, right? But we're charging $5,000 per site. I want them on the Tesla experience, the Apple Store experience of knowing that we're not just having to sign a paper and kick them out. They've, everything is branded. Everything is logo. We have follow-up phone calls. So you want to reassure them that that investment is worth it because you know what? Implants don't fail on happy patients. Or actually, I should say, pay, unhappy patients don't sue you when an implant fails. You're going to get a small failure rate. But happy patients understand that it's biology. It can happen. Let's just replace it. If they're feeling rushed or you, they don't see that you've invested so much of your brand into this experience for them, they're going to be, they're going to hold you accountable for every little thing that doesn't go right. So that's kind of our concierge patient experience. Again, Printing out little tabs with medicine, it doesn't cost anything. Creating comfort menus, post-op instructions. These are not things that I'm stacking extra costs to doing this, providing the service. These are just ways that I'm training my team to talk to our patients. We show them. I'll show them how we're laying out their, um, they're designing their guides and designing their implants. And these are all taken from my internal camera. That's rather a little blurry, but it's okay. They're not, they don't have to be perfect. I just take my internal camera and I'll show patients, hey, look, these are some of your and what your guide's gonna look like. Have your team set it up, have those workflows set up in advance because my first 10 implants, I'm shaking a little bit because it's just a new workflow and they're very intimidating, a lot of pieces. If it's all laid out, when you walk in and it's game time and you tell yourself, you got this, we've trained for this, we're ready for this. So have all of that ready. And we just take these, we just snap these with our internal camera and show our patients afterwards. They love seeing where it was placed. Now, I'm not necessarily saying, well, look at that depth, you know, and I'm going to platform switch it because we're expecting two millimeters of crestal bone loss. No, I'm saying, look, we got great placement. Here are some pictures. This is what it's going to feel like. That's part of your brand. That's the patient verbiage that you need to start training yourself into. And you don't learn this in dental school, unfortunately. You need to learn, you learn at your side, learn as you go. So take it from all of us that have been talking to you for the past 30 days, lessons that we've learned about this. But we want to say underneath the white coat, and I'm realizing this now and saying this maybe might sound a little, you know, PC, not PC, that not underneath the white coat. You don't want to see what's underneath the white coat. You, underneath the person behind the white coat, don't lose that humility, like Dr. Mustafa was saying, because you know what? There's going to be a day we're going to come across a PA like this, and you're going to be like, what kind of dentist would stick an implant? You know, this cocky dentist sticks an implant where there's a root tip there, and, you know, we, we'll kind of bash this kind of dentistry, and it's out there. And this dentistry was mine. This was one of my first five cases. We got, we were just so excited about our workflows and the brand and the Instagram. And, and we put, um, we didn't get the post-op scan from the surgeon back that took out the tooth in time. And I said, okay, I just kind of dismissed it and we placed it. And I didn't realize that there was root tips left back there. It's a gut check. It's a humbling moment. This is the picture of this, P, this PA is up in my office right here on the side because it's a reminder be humble. 
no matter the technology that we have and we think we're badasses and we're superheroes, remember your skill set, don't cut corners and remind yourself to double check every scan before you go on to the next step. And so this was my gut check and we all need that. Nobody's perfect. And so that was my implant journey. The, so we're kind of circling it back and how we're doing on time. Okay, we're doing okay. Um, the, kind of the importance of this branding is what I, what I came back to, coming back to this is that when you see this logo now, I wanted my patients, I wanted my community, I wanted my family that has invested in me to see this logo and our brand and be proud of it. And I can be proud of it. And it's like a cup of coffee. You're going to get good service and a good quality product. Put your brand out there. I've showed you guys my brand. You can certainly copy my brand as long as you're not within five miles of Milwaukee. I don't care what you do, <laughs> but you can take this brand, but go make your own brand. And it doesn't have to be Apple Store tech gadget. It can be Victorian. It can be golf themed. It can be, um, you know, however, you group, large group practices, 20 practices, whatever it is. Just own it, put it out there, and, and, and back up your brand with what you value. Now, you've had talks on this, and you've had some great lectures on investing in social media and utilizing these, um, all these social media platforms, but my advice is put it out there. Everything that you're doing, this was our big push now the past week or two. We just snapped some pictures. We're showing our patients how we are preparing for them. We put cheesy videos out there, and they're not perfect, but you put them out there. We're showing them, hey, these are our our um, PPE stations for my team. We make you know funny signs and and uh, we have check-in stations. So we're showing them this is our new check-in station where you'll get your temperature taken. You're going to sign a release form, and we'll let you come inside. This um, the stations with the shields and the masks and stuff, and they've been outfitted more with N95s and stuff now. But that was for our my team. It was very important that my team felt safe. Um, I know you guys were asking before we got on. Not, I've been working, we started, we opened up yesterday, what are some pearls that I could share with you, all of you who are going to be opening soon, hopefully in the next month. To me, you guys, you're all smart. You're smart. You get it. We've been reading. We're doing webinars. We know what we're supposed to be doing, what we're not supposed to be doing to feel safe. The best thing you can do, though, is make your team feel safe. I got mine in for two days. We did full days. Dry runs. Put on your PPE. As simple as where should we hang this up if we're taking a restroom break? And because we need to create those barriers, those optical barriers of where COVID is going and where COVID is not going. And we didn't want it in the break rooms and things like that. So they don't know those answers yet. Create those compartmentalized systems. So I, I set up a station, put everything here. If you're walking into the back area where we don't want any PPE because people are out where they're without their gowns on there. Um, that helps us compartmentalize the fear of that this is a kind of a, a nervous time for us to be practicing. We've seen the reports. Den the dental world is at the highest risk for, for COVID acquisition because requirement because it's, you know, dentists, hygienists, and our dental assistants. We are breathing in aerosolizing procedures all day long. How do we downplay that scary? How do you downplay that scary to your patients? And how do you downplay that scary to your team? Well, you're, we're humble. I say, I cannot guarantee that you're not gonna be exposed. But we are healthcare workers. It's our duty, it's our honor to take care of our patients. So I'm gonna equip you with all the shields, all the masks, all the gowns, whatever I can get my hands on, it's available for you. So your teams know that you're invested in them, you're hearing them, you're hearing their concerns, and you're gonna set up stations, and then you can you know, wear what, what you feel comfortable in because everyone's gonna have a different take on it. My team was so ready yesterday. They felt like they're, you know, they're prepared for battle. Our, we had 37 patients in like seven hours and everyone went smoothly. Our patients came in. They didn't sense the fear. They were just like, okay, we see you wearing some new shields and things like that. And we kept it light because guys, the world has to go on. We have to get back up and practice. We cannot shut down. We're going to have to practice and we're going to have to practice and produce more because our reimbursements are going to get cut and PPE is going to cost more. So now more than ever, we need to create these workflows and environments where our team feels safe and our patients feel safe. So I'm, I'm happy to chat again more with you guys offline about other things that we've done and some of that verbiage. But my biggest takeaway for how to prepare for opening that you haven't already heard yet is do dry runs with your team. Let them feel safe. Let them answer all their questions, even as silly as it is, is, you know, where can I hang this when I'm taking a bathroom break? Because that's going to put them at ease and they're going to be ready to go and they're going to be your unified vision. So to wrap it all up, basically, what's your brand? You know, what's, what's 
do you value? Mine was, this is what I came around to. And I, these are some of mine and you can borrow any of these because our brands should be shared and dentists, we all need to lift each other up and support each other. And basically it came down to though, I maximize those workflows. I wanted to increase my ROI because we, you know, we, we know our numbers. We, we create more time for our work-life balance. I have more fulfilled team members at the end of it, hands down, better patient experience. That's what I wanted to do with building my brand. And gearing up for the digital generation, guys, this is who we are targeting. These are our patients. These are going to be our patients for, the, for our legacy practices. For, we're going to be treating them for 20, 20 years. So put your brand out there as a digital generation. All of you millennials, this is the new stuff for you. But I always say you do not get a second chance to make a good first impression, especially in dentistry. And for the record, this is not my, this is not my alginate. It's, it's a taken off the internet. I don't take alginates like that. <laughs> but you don't get a second chance to make a first, good first impression. So pencil your brand down on paper now, things that you value, and start building your, your career. I always end on this. I always say, you know, Dr. Peabody was a, a, a Harvard professor in medicine. And we're out there and we're talking about putting things out on the gram and our fancy technology and going to CE courses and KOLs and all this stuff is phenomenal. It's a great perk of the, of the career that we have been lucky enough to be in, guys. But it comes down to, hands down, our first and foremost obligation and honor is taking care of our patients. And so he always says, the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for your patients. Don't ever forget that that's our primary job is to take care of our patients, make them feel better, make them want to smile. So I hope this was helpful. Thank you. It was absolutely incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, uh, Mona. That was absolutely, it was so good and inspiring and well done. Um, we're going to go ahead, before we start with our Q&A, we're going to pass the mic on to Dr. Jen Martins just for some mm -hmm. housekeeping mm -hmm. items. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just want to say thanks for another great talk. Very informative. Um, so the housekeeping items, a reminder to type your name and your email address in the group chat uh, for CE verification purposes. All the recording from the lectures will be posted on our YouTube page, Dentistry Academy. You can follow us on LinkedIn and or Instagram for updates. And tonight at 6 p.m. we have Dr. Tina Kokosis, who will be talking about a new classification of periodontal and peri-implant diseases, a breakdown of why, when, and how. Tomorrow at 11, we'll have Dr. Jake Carrier, who's gonna be talking about a new dentist journey into ownership. And then Dr. Mike Rondinelli, who will be discussing leadership, growth, and financial success in every department of the dental practice. Again, you can sign up at dtacademy.ca and the password is TRAC20, all caps. Thank you so much for that, Jen. Um, one quick announcement as well. Um, Nicolina was kind enough to actually email, um, uh, email the, um, um, what was the company called? That uh, the McNulty Group about the book that Dr. Mustafa um, suggested and they replied immediately with the e-copy of the book. So uh, make sure you, she did provide that information in the chat group. So if you are interested, uh, please make sure you email them and you will receive a copy within, she said, 15 minutes. So we'll go ahead, pass things on to Dr. Mike Gardy for the Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Shugan. Uh, so just want to thank you, Dr. Patel, for the very informative right. and inspiring talk with lots of great advice and uh, some mistakes to avoid as well. I know myself and all the other new grads out there watching, I uh, really appreciate that. So thanks again for sharing all that with us. Thank you. And in terms of the questions, we've got a few. So okay. first one is from Anonymous. Uh, who runs your social media? Is it your staff, a media company, or yourself? Okay, so I've gone through a few variations. I have a media company that manages my website because I don't know. Even though I'm Indian, I'm not very tech savvy with computer science. <laughs> they, they manage the text. Uh, the actual website and you just give them content. But I have people in my, my team. My team runs my social media, guys. Everything that you see out there is being filmed by a hygienist filming one of us, things like that. So there's no need to pay and have someone that has nothing to do with your brand, a third-party company, come in there and try to pro project your brand out. So have your young millennials in your office. Uh, you can either pay them extra or um, 
incentivize them, but have somebody internally run your social media if you can. Right. Okay. So that's a great, mm-hmm. like, uh, mm-hmm. authentic team, team mm-hmm. effort there. That's good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so second question, also anonymous. Um, how are you branding yourself online? Is your social media tailored for your patients or colleagues? So um, it's a great question because oftentimes we get um, caught into, we're putting cases out there and, you know, patients don't always need to see what your margin thickness was on a steric. They don't, they're not drawn to that. That's more for us to kind of brand to our colleagues and say, hey, this is my good work. You can refer patients to me. Uh, but we should be putting both. You should be putting out content out there to attract your colleagues because that makes your tribe and your network of friends and colleagues that would call each other. But also we put some of the layman's content out there for our community. And, and that's where the phone rings and that's when you're going to get patients calling in to come in. So I think you put a little bit of both, but you certainly value if you're building a practice, put more content out there that's relatable to somebody not in the dental world. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, last questions from Dr. Mian Quek. How do I become the poster child for dentistry in Canada? What's the secret? <laughs> well, um, you got to work on your pecs a little bit and you got to work on the bunch just a little bit and then they may start calling you Mian. <laughs> <laughs> they give me so much crap about this. You know what? It's I, everyone keeps. I'm very intimidated by how many smart, amazing, brilliant people I'm always surrounded by at all these events. And just you, just be you. Put your. I'm I'm a total jokester. People know that I'm. I mess up and and I think that if, just be you me and like let them see how awesome you are and you know what once you get the pecs up a little bit and then they'll then they'll be drawn to you and then you just go go find Patterson or Shine in Canada and just tell them you want to be their poster child <laughs> I'll put in a good word for you <laughs> tell me and he's uh, too old to be the poster child <laughs> Mike uh I have another question here that was posted to me anonymously and it's uh to, to you, Mona, uh, for a startup practice, do you recommend getting a CERC and CBCT off the gate? Or, um, you know, what is your return of investment? And do you think it's risky to go all out uh, on a startup to buy this kind of technology right off the okay. bat? So, so, yeah. Okay, so certainly, if you're able to secure your financing and you sit and look at your number and say, what's going to be my monthly payment? And if you're able to say, I can float that, or I have the support that can help me float that, then get then get it all you know get your CERC, get your cone beam get your treatment centers get it all but you know buying the elephant is easy it's feeding it every day that is expensive right so go back to what's going to be your date your monthly mortgage or your monthly loan payment and if it's something you're not going to be able to float which a lot of people may not be then start with CERC. hands at least for me and people will differ on this opinion but for me start with the CERC. you don't have to have a cone beam a cone beam helps you diagnose and see more and help have more treatment plan, treatment plan acceptance. But the tangible ROI on CEREC is will help re, re, uh, generate that cash flow for you to be able to purchase more. But look at your, your monthly number. If I buy one equipment, two, three, four, what boils down. That's what I did. And so I put outfitted enough that I could afford every month. And, and I, so I still have two operatories that need to be built out because we only built out six and I have space for eight. And so that would be my suggestion. And I agree with you for sure, Mona, yeah. if you're going to invest yeah. in anything, uh, a CAD CAM system is going mm-hmm. to have a much bigger impact on your return of investment yes. than yes. A CBCT. CBCT yeah. allows us to do amazing dentistry, but you can still mm-hmm. send that out very easily and, and still do the out. same level of dentistry. Exactly. But, you uh, can find, get a network of somebody down the street, somebody right. with a colleague has a CBCT and say, hey, I will pay you hundred bucks yep. per scan and have them go there and you can start reading and training on it. So, but you can't do that with your, with your CAD cam. That's right. So, so I think that's absolutely the first way to go for sure. Awesome. Well, we'll wrap things up. Thank you so much again for that, Mona. Okay. Um, just a everybody. quick and friendly reminder of tonight we have at 6 PM, we'll be welcoming Dr. Tina Kokosis, who will be talking to us about a new classification of periodontal and peri implant disease a breakdown of when, uh, why, when, and how, followed by tomorrow at 11 a.m. as always. Um, we'll be welcoming Drs. Jake Carrier and Dr. Michael Rondinelli. So please make sure that you tune into tonight and tomorrow's talks. I'd like to thank our co-hosts for the day, Drs. Uh, Jeff Sumner 
uh, Jennifer Martins, Dr. Ziad Hamad, and Dr. Mike Gard. You guys did a fantastic job. And thank you so much for your help behind the scenes. Um, and I would also like to thank our speakers for the day as well. Dr. Hassan Mustafa, you did an incredible job. Thank you so much for that. That was very informative. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Mona Patel, Thank you for that as well. Very informative. I would love your thank energy. You. Love your presentation. <laughs> thank, uh, you. And thank you so much for joining us today, especially taking the time out of your busy and, and now open practice to uh, to do it for us. So, hey, um, if I don't have to wear PPE, I will do anything yeah. for a work day. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll wrap things. We'll wrap things up for the day. Once again, thank you, everybody. Have a great day, and we'll see you all tonight at six p.m. All right. Bye bye.